Quack. Hey guys, today we found a couple of cream colored uh, crackers on TikTok and today I want to talk about those people on TikTok and uh, all that good stuff that comes with the, the app on TikTok. Hey, Turf. Yeah, that's not happening. It's me, the devil. You didn't do enough sins this month, so now you gotta go to Jubilee Purgatory. At least this time it wasn't a crime against the cream colored conquistadors. <laughs> Hey, Editing Aranok here. Uh, we decided to split the video into two parts, so the second half is more focused on the transphobia, but it does come up during this one. Also, Turb lost the first hour of his footage, so had to re-record all of that, so if anything seems a little disconnected, that's why. Also, this video is a critique on Jubilee centrism, not the people. The people may be bigoted, but let's keep the harassment at a zero. Don't attack these people. Please, don't do it. And, and I'll pat you on the head. Isn't this my room? Oh, hey, Chur. I guess you're the person I gotta service next. I should probably explain how I ended up here. <laughs> Lucy doesn't love it when people attack and dethrone his dad. That's kind of based, though. I I think God's doing some some weird stuff in heaven. I mean, like, what's up with that? Um, uh, ten, ten Commandments thing. That seems like a sub-dom kind of fetishy thing. It was more more like Lucy wanted to be the one to do it. So, like, as a little favor, I've come to just deal with some cases, do a little, you know, punishing of people. That's also kind of just torture for me because we're, we're watching Jubilee videos. We're watching Jubilee videos. So you're a, a hit woman? Yeah. Do you work for hire? Yeah, you can hire me. Okay, listen, I kind of want to take someone out. Like on a nice sunlit dinner, maybe a couple of wine glasses, maybe a dessert. Hey, you guys. Actually get on with it now. So, so what, what are we, what are we gonna watch first? What, what, uh, choose your poison, my guy. <laughs> Well, Jubilee has 993 videos dedicated to provoking human understanding and connection. What they mean by that is, um, is being, being very centrist and pretending like that's not a political position. <laughs> you know, some human connections aren't really the ones we, we want to create. Uh, some of these connections are in conformity with the ones that are enacting those means of, of racism. It's, it's almost like when we, when we pretend that people debating, you know, my existence or your existence, uh, have a point that that's not great. Uh, I don't know guys. I think, I think it's pretty great when people pretend like they aren't evil and then just do horrible things. Jubilee is literally doing these elaborate Trojan horses of white supremacy for those dads that you see clipping figure eight shrubs in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> Not really us. They don't really, they don't really want to create connections with us. And there's this one I'm seeing right now. It says, did slavery affect your family? Africans versus African Americans. And as an African, I think that's a pretty, pretty interesting conversation. Would you like to start the video now? I think we kind of have to. Hey, Turb, it's me, the devil. You gotta watch the video now. Okay, I'm clicking Lucifer. <laughs> me coming from Africa, I came here to better my life. And I feel like personally, we need to stop using the word racism when we don't get something or when something don't go our way. I'm gonna pause this immediately, I got something to say. So a lot of Africans don't get the rhetoric of racism in the Western world for very good reason, because over there racism works so much more differently than what it does here because of the effects of imperialism. Whereas in predominantly black places, like where I live in South Sudan, um, racism doesn't work in the same way as it does in the West. In confliction with actual white actors you know what i mean more so this racism is split between divides on uh, ethno groups like distinct ethno groups and features heavily including colorism obviously it's not like that everywhere because in places like south africa you actually have white actors inflicting an apartheid state but not not it's not in the whole of africa so i see how this this specific person i guess that's their experience with it because it was also mine and a lot of my families. Whereas like we come to the West and we have this glamorized idea of like, oh my God, America, 
Canada, look here, we can have freedom, we can do so much things. But guess what? You're still not free from the shackles of white supremacy. That bitch everywhere, man. That bitch everywhere, and that bitch carry a whip with her. She whipping. And <laughs> and I live in Canada, like one of the best places in the world, apparently, in the West. That's what people think. <laughs> People think. People think. <laughs> People think, yeah. And there's a cognitive dissonance with parents and children, specifically in when we're talking about spears of racism, because children see the difference between middle class, upper class, whatever. I remember the first time I went to a middle class household and I sat down and had dinner for the first time. I had three meals that day. What? That's a jarring experience for a lot of us. And uh, the problem is, even as we're subjected like into the country, the townhouses, they stick us in poor infrastructure awful infrastructure. When I lived in the north side, there literally were, were some days where they had to bring a water truck out and we had to come with like buckets and everything and grab water from those buckets because our water was ass. And because our electricity wasn't running, uh, sometimes we had to like sleep, no electricity. And that happens. And that's just the thing that happens. That's the thing that people from, people that are not from townhousing or from disenfranchised areas will not see. And it's racist because they stick all the immigrants in it while their parents work part-time jobs and still have that same rhetoric of, oh, the Western idea and instill it onto their kids. Well, it's 10 times harder for their kids to even ascend to that position than it is for white kids or other higher privileged kids. I think it's the, it's the, the lack of engaging as, with racism as, as a system. Like I, I see the same types of failures in, in the context of communities that I'm a part of. There's a certain type of rich and white queer person that, that doesn't recognize uh, these things as like systemic and they engage in it as, as like interpersonal. The Pete Buddha judges, right? Where they're like, well, we got marriage. We're equal, everything's good. And it's like, no, it isn't. You're fine to some degree, except that your acceptance is completely conditional and they'll tear it away from you as fast as they can. But also just that like, because they're in a position where they're economically sound or they aren't experiencing like really direct discrimination in their workplace, they don't register that it's still affecting a lot of people, usually BIPOC queer people and, and disabled queer people. I get that negligence to issues in tandem with privilege because in South Sudan, a lot of that is set up like that, where it's like different groups beefing with other ethno groups who were given power by colonial forces, you know, in, in government or parliament or whatever. And it's just ethno groups uh, beefing without, you know, acknowledging this group is more privileged or something, coming into intersectional terms with their differences. And I get what they're saying mm. when they're saying, let's just erase the word black and white and nothing will ever happen, you know, that will erase the connotation of it. But it won't. And trust me, because I live in that same world, I live in that same neoliberal mindset of like, okay, if I ignore my skin tone, if I ignore my peer's skin tone, if I ignore everything, then racism won't affect me, racism won't touch me. But guess what? That shit still touched me. <laughs> Just because I don't see my own color, that racist gun with the cop is still gonna see my color. Like, this whole thing of abandon the idea of black and white is backwards in itself. Yeah, and it's it's exactly it's exactly that. It's like... That's great, Pete Buttigieg, that your rich friends pretend to accept you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, when it comes down to it, you're still a word I can't say on YouTube yeah. <laughs> to, to the bigots. And like, to a queer person who's poor, especially if they're not white, as you said, that cop's gun is the same, you know? And as someone who's experienced violence mm -hmm. and, and violent harassment, like in the city that I live in. I, I think if you're rich enough, you gotta get to isolate yourself from that type of experience of being harassed. Cause like, if you're fucking rich enough, you're not going to the grocery store. Yeah, you're doing that Walmart plus <laughs> shit that like Kim Kardashian is is um doing right now. You're getting that shit shipped to your house. You're not going, you're not, you're not going outside. When, when you're rich enough, you don't have to interact with the dirty pores. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Turb and I, you're not, you're not interacting with people, the people that Turb and I have to deal with. Like, mm -hmm. You're just not. And even then, like, yeah. we know for a fact that, that that level of richness doesn't completely absolve you of dealing with that shit. As you said, right? You're still black to a cop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me put you in a little bit of a thought experiment. If you're a black comedian, right? You're going up, right? You're making jokes. You're making the audience laugh, right? You might feel hella good about yourself. But if there was a 90% white audience laughing at black jokes and your whole platform is centered around laughing at black people, clowning black people for these fucking cauliflower cream 
color the chemical compounds then what if 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 you're if you're running around saying that that queer rights don't need to be fought for anymore I don't know yeah I, I don't know what to say right yeah now. especially now <laughs> when like 200 especially right now 200 trans uh anti-trans bills it's way are, more way yeah, more than two, 200 oh it's wow. close to 400 now Holy. way more yeah this year this year has been like like last year was in the 200s yeah but mm -hmm. um no this year this year is well over 300 editing aranok here i i hadn't looked at the statistic in a while it's it's actually at 543 as of recording if you want more specific details, look up translegislation.com. They track anti-trans bills in the U.S. Finn did an amazing video about one of these bills. If you're Canadian and you want to help with one of these bills. Yeah, I guess we're going to bury the lead. The whole point of, of us talking about Jubilee today, uh, other than other than just this is torture, is that <laughs> is that is that Jubilee is, is particularly obsessed with race and trans people. That's their bread and butter. That's their Kobe and Shaq. That's their Kevin Hart and Dwayne Johnson. That's their Dinka people in Aceta Danka. That's their white people in SPF 80 sunscreen. <laughs> let's jump into it. Yeah, let's just jump into it. I just have to say something real quick. Um, I'll, 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 I'll start going devil. I'm sorry. Hey, Turf, it's me. The longer you spend, the more you're in pain. So it's good for me. <laughs> I'm gonna be in hell for the next eight years, but any pain is better than this. Any pain is better than watching a black man with dreads degrade black people. Anything is better. Anything is better than this, Lucifer. Just let me jump in real quick. No disrespect, but racism exists, and I have to acknowledge it. Okay, we, we got one dude. That dude's at least saying something okay. That's my favorite little milk dud. That's my boy. Milk, milk duddy duddy, milk duddy dee, milk dee duddy, milk dee duddy duddy. <laughs> Slavery affected my family. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just evident in my last name, King. I mean, that's the brand of the slave owner that put that name on my family all those years ago, and I'm still wearing it. I want to stop it here and say that's a very interesting thing to say in comparison to African and Black American struggles. Because my last name was a forced thing too, because when we were immigrating here, they kind of forced us to do a little last name and we don't really do last names. So um, uh, we went under the moniker of Dang. But Dang isn't my actual last name and Dang isn't actually how we use last names where we are. At least in my little village, Dang is just um, where I come from. It's a reference to the Dinka tribe. Even other people in my tribe would reference to me in our mother tongue saying son of million. I think like names are such an important thing to understand like histories and the linguistics of regions and like what that means for who you are as you, as you exist now, right? Uh, you know, my Irish side of the family, like the effect of British colonialism on names is definitely felt there. That's not at all the same thing as this, but it is a different way that like, in the same way that you are experiencing a different effect of like white supremacists thinking around names, where it's like, oh, you got to fit into a Western naming scheme and it's got to be spelt in a way that makes sense for an anglophone speaker right we see this with with uh chinese last names right because usually the, the family name is first place first but like in the west you have to put it after or people get confused because there's that dominant idea of like what the name means no though i i was talking to my partner about this though and my partner has a spanish first name and a french last name and them being a black American have a very different experience with names than I do. So them having that last name is like a reminder of oppression to them. So they were thinking of like removing the name and doing an X like Malcolm X did because as they were reading that, they draw an inspiration for the way Malcolm X kind of got rid of all his colonial ties, uh, especially in the usage of names. And I didn't really know how to feel about that because that's like kind of a colloquial role. And I didn't really know how to feel about that because that's kind of a colonial relinquishment of a black oppression, you know what I mean? And to me, I didn't get that same experience. Like I'm African and I haven't really experienced that. And in the Western systems of racism, uh, that black people who have actually been living here during history and right after child slavery, that just, I don't experience. 
And I feel like if they had this conversation very open and honest, then they would also actually come to like an epiphany of some sort, like saying, oh, this is how you're oppressed. Well, this is how oppression has fit into my life. And these are the differences between them. And they can actually have a very transformative like conversation. But the way that this video pits them against each other disallows that conversation to happen. Instead, it's a debate. Cause I learned when I did that with my partner. Um, it has never stopped. So there is no post. What my great grandparents were teaching my grandparents who, who taught my mother, who taught me, came from what they learned through slavery. So there's a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity, a fear of society, a fear of law enforcement. So slavery has made a major impact where the low self-esteem is consistently reoccurring. Bro, my boy's base. Shout out Milk Dud, shout out Milk Dud, Milk Dud, find who Milk Dud. And this is actually drawn from like what we're gonna talk about in like a week and a half in the next video I say. Like race kind of alienates you and kind of predisposes you to fit like a certain mold. Like this is a black man. This is LeBron. This is Kevin Durant. This is Michael Jordan. This is Obama. These are the good black men. And then when you don't connect with those figures, it's like, oh, you're not connecting with those figures? This isn't you? Well, fuck you, you're not black. <laughs> And this way of thinking goes into respectability politics yeah. and tokens. Well, and, and, and how you're supposed to perform in society is definitely racialized. Like, and I, I know Bellamy's gonna be happy when I say this, but like a lot of white trans women don't want to reflect on the, the realities that like part of the thing that we have to struggle with is the box that is white women. You have a specific set of expectations that are related to that. And I think part of the issue with people not acknowledging that like in a trans space is that it doesn't, it doesn't acknowledge the experience and existence of having to deal with what you're talking about right which is that that racialized and gendered box that is placed on you you know mm -hmm. that's how you get fucking perpetuations mm -hmm. of of racism in queer spaces mm -hmm. is not recognizing that like it's not just one or the other it's both inter mm -hmm. interplaying with each other that create that social expectation and it's wild because Jubilee is giving us very nuanced conversations right now. Like, when is it going to pivot? You know, like, when is, there's always a hard pivot. We paused at the beginning for a reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's worth, I think it's worth saying that, like, the people that run Jubilee aren't black. And I think it's interesting that they would present someone saying racism doesn't exist as the first thing in the, in the video. Jubilee does this thing where they act like presentation of information is, is agnostic in and of itself. That their framing and the order that things are presented to the audience are, are not in and of themselves political ideological statements. It's like pretending like you shouldn't be mad at X and Y director for doing male gaze and objectifying women with the camera because they're just sexy and on camera. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the director doesn't have any control of that, but the director is choosing to present them in a certain way, but choosing how they're presented to specifically accentuate, objectify and, and sexualize. And in this case, what I think, what I think this video is doing is presenting racism as debatable by using a black person to say it. Pitting them against each other is wild in, in the context of like this framing. Like between black people, these conversations in the real world get infinitely nuanced and people actually kind of learn from them and they're way more productive. But it, 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 the framing, the box. <laughs> Because black people have conversations like this all the time, but the way they're rating it and they're rating the degrees and framing it in a way that combats each other instead of the system of white supremacy, mm -hmm. that's where the issue comes with. And the social connotation of racism is only viable when there's political actors present. Political actors being, uh, most of the time, white people. But, it, you know, like we said, in Africa, in, in, in parts of Africa, and in the West, there's um, different sorts of racism. I think for me, growing up in Los Angeles, California, in the early 1960s, so I see how my boy Milk Dud is so good with understanding the intricacies of racism with cops specifically, because that boy from LA, the police are just not the best there. They don't have the best reputation. I think we had a little, a lot of, a lot of groups talking about that, like maybe NWA. So obviously when they bring people from different regions where different political powers have been oppressing them in different ways, they're gonna be talking about their methods of racism that they see in their areas, right? But the way that racism is being tackled isn't in tandem with white supremacy. So it sets it up to be like an oppression off between two people, 
You know what I mean? Because right now the word racism is kind of being watered down in its nuances and not being expounded upon. And it's, it's, it's being, it's being attacked and it's being talked about in a very weird way. Again, it's, it's that framing thing. Mm -hmm. They're framing it and then acting like they aren't part of the creation of the meaning of the video. Mm -hmm. It's just a conversation, but it's like, well, you chose who's going to be here. Mm -hmm. You're choosing to present it as this versus, like even just the use of the word versus is telling. Okay, guys, you need to keep going. It's very saddening when you can literally only go back a couple generations and then it's like the documents just don't exist. There's no record. It's like, you know, my family has completely been erased. In that same point too, in the time that we've been here, we've created a incredible culture and we have so many things to be proud of and I always reframe the narrative myself and I speak of my ancestors that were enslaved as you know doctors and healers and it's like you know we were taken because we were talented no but I really just want to clap for him one time because besides how patronizing this is he's doing really well and he's trying I, I think I think what's valuable is is like I don't judge the people who go on here and try to use the space to say something valuable. I guess that's an important point that we should make like right now, mm -hmm. um, is that we're not judging the people who are participating in these conversations inherently. We're probably gonna judge some of them a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, we're, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and if you ever come in here again with a goddamn opinion, I will shove it so far up your ass, you'll never see the light of day again. But, 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 but I think it's, I think it's worth noting that like what, what our, I guess, issue with Jubilee is, is how they do this centrist, we're not ideological. Mm -hmm. We don't have a standpoint, mm -hmm. but someone debating the existence of trans people is acceptable conversation, mm -hmm. but we should present a discussion of whether or not racism exists specifically in a way which implicates a specific type of black person as being in conflict with a different type of black person. Mm -hmm. You are saying something by presenting it that way. And tough conversations are healthy. Tough conversations are really healthy. And I feel like if this video, like you said, wasn't framed in this kind of way, they would be having way more nuanced conversations and healthier conversations than they do now. Because when I have conversations with my friends, I have to frame things differently, right? Because a lot of conversations on the left are like buzzwords, right? To normal people. To, to this point, uh, the right has co-opted like a lot of words like woke and uh, anti-white racism and things like that. I can't really say white fragility in front of my friends and expect them to know what that means because they haven't read the book and they haven't uh, put in the work, just like most of society hasn't. So even when I talk about some things where I'm like, the suburbs has better housing, they're like, you live in the suburbs, bruh. I live in a townhouse. I live in a townhouse. That's just not the same thing, like. <laughs> There's a suburb like 10 or like 20 minute drive away from me, sure. But me living, this is not a suburb, this is hell. But there's a framing in these messages and uh, people really don't understand the concept of like a hood. These white people outside in Edmonton, Alberta understand hoods as like this action sensationalized thing of Hollywood where like niggas are hopping out of helicopters, shooting AKs, putting a fucking red beam on their Glock, all for a gram of weed, you know. It's not, it's not, it's not like that here. That's not what it is. We're, that's, it's, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not Battlefield 3 out here. Like, I'm sorry I'm not doing a Tom Cruise stunt out of a yacht just to enter my trap house. I'm sorry, I I'm not in the bando. And it's patronizing how in Western frames, this is my experience. But no, 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 this is not my experience. This is actually my experience. And when I actually talk about that experience, I get shut up because it's not the sensationalized or co-opted image of it. So sometimes I have to like, you know, skirt around frames in order to get my friends or other people to really understand things. Yeah, and I think, I think it's important to say that, like, we're not saying conversations are bad. We're saying this company is creating a product off of sensationalizing marginalized people and framing the conversations in a certain way, which presents an ideological bent they don't want the audience to acknowledge exists. Slavery didn't affect my family, but we did, but we did suffer a different type of slavery back home. Like, we went through colonization, like, I, I am Bamileke, there was a, a massacre of Bamileke, you guys can like look it up, they killed like more than 300,000 of my people. 
because we didn't want to assimilate to, to the French culture. But it's still nothing compared to what you guys' ancestors like been through, you know? I wouldn't want to minimize that pain, though, that 300,000 people were, were killed because they would not conform to the colonization of the French people. So that is just as painful and hurtful as the, the trauma that we suffered here in America. That's how you have conversations. When a dude's like, oh, maybe my oppression is not like, no, reaffirm them because all experience of anti-blackness are fucking negative. So reaffirm it. And it's, it's not about who gets it worse. It's about about being able to acknowledge the realities of what everyone's experienced mm. and the value of having real conversations about the stuff. And I do like, like what they're doing here mm -hmm. is that they are acknowledging that while they have different pain, it's coming from the same system. And I could feel the pivot coming. Like the minute those people sat down, I felt the pivot coming. It's like a, it's like a Kobe turnover when he got it back to the bucket. Like, you know, he gonna, you know, the mamba going to spin. It's just a matter of when. <laughs> like if they just stayed with that interaction with like those three people, like th th this would have been an A plus video. But it, or, it, or if it just left there, if it just stopped there with the, these two, that interaction between these two was good. We also had our own type of slavery. We had apartheid at the time, you know, mm -hmm. where the Dutch people took over and they wanted to just have South Africa, Namibia, and I think other countries where we could only just speak Dutch. It's somehow still happening even now. There's like a place in South Africa where it's called Orania, you know, and it's just Dutch people there no black person is even allowed there. So we still somehow feel that oppression even now. I didn't even know that. Arania, Arania, how do I pronounce that? I, I gotta search that up later. The, the amount of land that was designated to an extremely tiny white minority was huge. It was, it was close to 80% at several points in history. Like it depends which period of the 1900s we're talking, right? Um, Cause mm -hmm. the, the number shifts up and down and generally the black population at around 13%. And my dad uh, frequents trips to Africa because he just loves going there. That's where he's from. And uh, when he visited South Africa, um, he was showing me photos of these beautiful purple trees just blooming in the fall, you know, just falling down. And I was like, in awe but like as he drove past the other side of it it was fucking atrocious the infrastructure on the two sides of south africa you could literally see how they colonially built these systems to be predatory towards the black population and benefactory towards the white population when you look at that video but it's nothing compared to what your ancestral history you know has gone through i'm somehow happy that you guys have forgiven it even though you haven't forgotten it but no i have not forgiven because it's a system that's still going on and from what i'm hearing from you guys there's a system that's still going on in africa as well and it's uh and it's a war on us the africanism let's go so let's let's talk about let's talk about how the fucking start of the video frames that conversation as them debating whether or not racism happens and then when we actually get to the conversation, they're fucking talking about like systems of oppression that exist in both places. It's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. again, sensationalized framing that like isn't accurate to what's being said or what marginalized people think. And I don't want to take anything away from these people because you can unpack um, systems of racism in your own way in in, in, a, in a million different ways, you know? Like um, that white guy that sped past me in a car and screamed the N word, I could be like, hey, that guy was hella racist and that's just irrefutable. But racism as a social concept is so ingrained in society that it works in tandem with political actors who carry out the idea of racism or infrastructure that carries out the idea of racism or jobs that carry out the ideas of racism. Racism is the main cause of poverty among black people in America. And this question saying, is racism the main cause of poverty among black people in America? That question is infinitely nuanced in tandem with the political actors of the time, in tandem with the policies at the time, in tandem with, 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 with anti-blackness at the time. It's not really the same across America, but yes, racism is the problem. It just worked very differently. And I feel like they're gonna try to spin everyone's different ideas of black poverty and pit them against each other. Like, no, this person thinks this, this person thinks like this. It's a way to stagnate progress. It's, like the, let's just say it's from white supremacy and dead it there.
This question plays into the apologetics of it all, of like the internalization of, I guess, playing into a system that doesn't like you. You know, this is literally just white apologetics. And this affects a lot of people, a lot of marginalized people, like me. When I went into uni, I was like, well, the bounds of racism didn't affect me all the way up to here, so guess what? I just gotta keep pushing. I just gotta keep, I can go with my own intellect. I can go with my own, my, myself. I can put myself up. And, and guess what? That shit still swung at me like Mike Tyson. And, and it knocked me out. I'm dropped out. <laughs> So racism works in intricate ways and thinking that it's not plays into like upholding the status quo of it all, right? Because um, these centrist ideas with Jubilee is essentially just upholding the status quo. So I'm kind of scared to see what these guys do here. I'm kind of scared for some goobers to act up right now. I think like, again, just framing this question, it's too simplified because it's like, well, like, what do you mean by cause of poverty? Mm -hmm. I would say that the the system of white supremacy in America is the primary cause of poverty for black people and most poor people mm -hmm. in America. But to understand that requires understanding A, slavery, B, the period of time after slavery and the laws that were put in place, C, Jim Crow era policies, D, the policies that were discriminatory in the North that was still preying off of black labor Ally. because they weren't slaves. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then you need to understand shit. Like, then you have to understand like every single time that, that black wealth was ever built up, the fucking way that it was burned to the ground, whether you have, you know, <laughs> Black Wall Street. The Tusla massacre. And, and there's, lit the, the, there's literally a city uh, in Alberta mm -hmm. uh, where we live that was like, burnt to the ground because immigration reforms um, were way more open back in the 1970s and they were accepting everybody right including disenfranchised black people that wanted a place to stay and then they got very successful in these places and guess what they got kicked the fuck out they faced racism from a lack of funding they faced racism from the edmonton and calgary areas because they were predominantly white and these places were black my little sisters literally learned this in class before I did. It's in the curriculum now, thank God. But I didn't learn that in school, you know? Yeah. Oh, so is the right agree and the left disagree? No, it's the people who don't come to the middle that, that disagree. Ah, ah, my boy Milk done, man. My boy Milk, come on, man. If opportunity is right here, they will give it to people of other race than African American and Africans too. So if there's a job that maybe have math requirement, I feel like they'll pick an Asian person. Ah, oh, no, you were, it was so good. And then it was so not good. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was on the right track then, yeah. That just goes to show how racism also plays a role in on other groups in the black community too. Like there is that stereotype of Eastern Asian people specifically. And I also think, um, I think the crucial like missing point when we talk about economic disparity, time, time is the most valuable currency. And you're not allowed to take out business loans. You're not allowed to read, you're not allowed to write. You have to first fight to become three fifths of a citizen. Then you got Jim Crow and then you got everything else. It's like, you're now having to buy in at a price so high because the time is irreparable. You can't get that back. That, that was part of what I was talking about. It's also really worth noting that like, even in our current lifetimes, an easiest example of this is the Irish American. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm saying this is an Irish Canadian. If people want to get mad at me, they can, but like, <laughs> Because in the middle of, of the la like in the, the 19th century, right, at a certain point, white supremacy decided, you're white. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of that discrimination went away. And suddenly, like, even even those those groups that have only had like one generation ahead or even just within that generation. Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about earlier, too, with the with the internship thing. Like, I felt this my whole entire mm -hmm. life, literally in some internships uh, when you apply international, because I was looking at um, going to law school after my postgrad dropped out at this point. So probably not. You have to you have to literally send a head photo at some places, a photo of yourself. You you. You don't think that's like a little racially charged? Or I know for myself as a trans woman, like if I am perceivably trans, I'm not gonna get hired. But, but, but I also, I also wanna say it is more likely that I will get hired as a white trans person than a black trans person would be. It's all in the framing of white man. They, they want Noah Samson. They don't want Turb. They don't want Eric. They want Noah Samson. They would have, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love you, Noah. I hope you know that. 
from a historical standpoint, we start with slavery, then that's centuries, generations of stolen labor, like you said. Then we get into Jim Crow, which is just an extension of that. Then we have redlining, we have mass incarceration, we have events like the bombing of Tulsa and Rosewood in Florida and all these different examples of our wealth being decimated. And I don't say that to come from a defeatist or a victim mindset, but I think if we just have an honest conversation about history and what we've gone through when we've been here, um, racism is definitely a big part of that. Victim mindset isn't real. Y'all need to know that. Victim mindset isn't real. That's not real. That's not, it's not. Victim mindset isn't fucking real, but like I, I think I think it. Like, but let's let's talk about the way that like as marginalized people, we're we're having to deal with like bullshit things that we know someone's gonna say about us. That guy isn't isn't arguing that victim mindsets are real. What he's doing is trying to avoid a certain type of person being shitty to him. Fuck, I know that feeling. <laughs> we we both know that feeling, like as marginalized video essays who tackle conversations, especially in places where our conversations aren't heard. I mean, like you and you and I have a lot have had a lot of conversations about this mm -hmm. privately. Mm -hmm. Like we talk a lot about what it, like the, the difficulty of feeling tokenized. Um, yeah, and I've never had the freedom uh, until I made video essays to actually have these conversations with people who were like also marginalized and not like uh what's a better word than uh i think that's gonna get me demonetized damn you're supposed to torture yourself but you're not supposed to get demonetized while doing it let's take that back with people that don't endorse in white apologetics i never really had the opportunity to have like these conversations so i do get that fear of like if i have these conversations mm -hmm. i have to constrain it in a certain way to make them understand so in a so in a certain way you're also policing your own experience and your own internalizations and you're and you're policing what you're allowed to say you're policing you're like and 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 it's not it's not an issue with with that guy i just wanted to like because i know you don't mean that but i just like Hey, actually, we're, we're doing it right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that sums it up perfectly, though. That we we have we spend so much time fucking carefully dancing around what we can and cannot say. I, as I grew up in Alberta, the most political conversations that we had. Oh, the oil's really high today. <laughs> like, oh, the oil's <laughs> really high today. Well, what's happening in the oil refineries? Right. N the conversations we have. Uh, concerning politics and um, uh, I guess governance are so uh, intellectualized in a way that fits that that doesn't allow racism to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Aaronock for letting me talk about this. I think, like we we allowed to talk about this now. Like out there when I go outside, when I go to my professor, I was not allowed to talk about this. I got a zero on my essay. So yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I I know yeah. exactly how you feel. Like I. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely always always nervous with like hitting on certain things. I'm nervous right now that I'm gonna lose marks in some classes that I'm in because I took some pretty directly pro-trans shit into some of my written things mm -hmm. and and was very direct about certain things where I was like, I might have criticized both of the classes I took for ignoring trans perspectives. Mm -hmm because those transfers are re relevant. I thought I was going to be the only one staying. I was going to be like, oh, I'm about to be like Kanye West, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, no, no. Un unironic agreement for Kanye West is the, is the I had, yeah, go away. I don't care that he made college drop out. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Get him out. Go away! There's a lot of things we can use as an excuse to hold us back, to not uh, not to reach our potential. It's up to us to look past that. You know, like me coming from Africa, I came here to better my life, my family. I'm the only one here. And since I have been here, there's a lot of bad things that happened to me. There's also a lot of good things that happened to me. Us African or African American, we need to like look past like racism. And this is what I was talking about: the different levels of oppression in Africa. And here, as poor as my family is, I don't have to pay rent right now. So when my mom gets a call from my cousins in Africa and they're like, okay, we need help. I help my cousins because I have a level of privilege that's foreign to them. That doesn't mean I'm the most privileged. It's just because pr privilege fluctuates in a way. The way I view privilege is generally that you're not having to deal with a problem. Just because you're not dealing with that problem doesn't mean you're not dealing with other problems. Like, mm -hmm. 
it's 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 recognizing that you're not dealing with a problem really mm -hmm. and and the the advantages and benefits you get from that bringing it back around to, to hiring bias right if you go to get hired and you don't get hired because you're black right you are dealing with an additional problem that's preventing you getting hired if i try to go get hired and i don't get hired because i'm trans i'm dealing with an additional problem that others like that cis people aren't going to have to deal with but here's the important thing both of us dealt with a problem different problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the cis white dude didn't have to deal with either of those problems yeah that doesn't mean that he he is exempt from potentially dealing with a problem yeah and that, this framing in a way that Oh, sorry. You, you, first, you first. No, no, go, 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 go. I was saying this framing in a way like points at um a specific level of Western privilege that we get because there we we live in a society that's oppressing other countries to fuel itself, right? Yes. A neoliberal society. We are not dealing with the problem of being in a country that is currently under attack from Western powers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's privilege, mm -hmm. right? But it's not like like. Like the thing about privilege is it's so invisible because you're not dealing with it. Of course, you're not going to be aware of your privilege. You don't experience the problem. And I think, I think maybe sometimes the problem, the problem with presenting privilege is, is, is presenting it as something you have rather than something that exempts you from dealing with certain problems. No disrespect, but racism exists and I have to acknowledge it. And I can't just ignore it. But yeah. what I can do is not buy into the system. You know, if I want to do something, let me be the entrepreneur. What I believe happened in the 1960s is that we started looking for equal rights to be equal with other people. And what we stopped doing, and I heard you talk about Tulsa, we stopped using the black owned businesses. Why did we stop using the black owned businesses? Cause they all got bombed by the CIA. Come on, I know. Okay, this, this is one of those black people that know racism exists, but then tries to endorse in systems of patriarchy, like these these black men are like oh but we could we could do jobs we could perform the role of the white man we could be business entrepreneurs you you, you buy into neoliberalism and it fucks your ability to have any sort of real understanding of racism or transphobia or queerphobia because because you cannot separate capitalism from white supremacy quick um uh, quick uh, experiment search up who did the nazis take influence from when they were making their policies uh, you might be a little sad. The Nazis loved American uh, policies, and the Americans loved hiring Nazis after World War II. Operation Paperclip. And as always, everyone has to watch Lady Knight's video, The Holocaust is Not a Metaphor. Mandatory viewing, IMO. Now, because you guys gotta understand, the Fair Housing Act in 1968, I'm five years old. That's when we could move off the east side of LA and move into other subcultures. So what I wanted to do at eight years old was go to IHOP. I didn't want to go to the Ma and Pa restaurant anymore. I wanted to go to, let's go eat at the hotels. The, the black dollar is a myth. The black dollar is a myth. The reason why black people don't have as much money in their communal areas is because they have to spend more money because they're impoverished and there's so much things that they have to buy and they don't have surpluses of money so every time they get money they have to spend the money they own they can't keep it they can't they can't <laughs> all i'm gonna say yeah. all i'm gonna say is that if you haven't heard of vimes boot theory of economics which is from discworld vimes lays out how a poor person when they buy a pair of shoes has to buy them cheap because they only have so much money those shoes don't last very long. If you buy 15 pairs of shoes over 15 years, you actually end up spending way more than if you bought one good pair. But a rich person, a rich person buys one good pair of boots, last them 15 years, they spend less. It is more expensive to be poor. There are a lot of successful black Americans, a lot of millionaires, a lot of, you know, business owners, but they're exceptions for sure for a reason. People may be asking, um, this is kind of a thing where I'm reaffirming biases right now. People may be asking, oh, look at Michael Jordan, look at Rihanna, look at ASAP Rocky, look at all these um, black celebrities that we uphold. Um, they're uphold for a reason. They up they're, they're upheld because they fulfill the status quo, the idea that black people can pull themselves up from their bootstraps, right? And that's why we uplift these this 1% of society. Realistically, if you look at the statistics you have to beat from birth, gang violence, police violence, if you go into schooling, uh, the percentage of people that come out of black schools in, in junior high, middle school, high school, university, like all of that is so fucking hard. And only like 
one percent of people make it out there because of systems of racism and capitalism and things like that well and, and, and even if you get through all of that let's mm -hmm. let, let's also acknowledge medical bias mm -hmm. bias from banks and things so it's harder to get started if mm -hmm. you're trying to get a loan everything like that right there's that mm -hmm. bias hiring biases mm -hmm. right like there's there's 50 fucking layers if you're darker skinned you're dealing mm -hmm. with colorism as well on top of just the general racism have you heard of all those patronizing stories of the black women who go on X Factor or whatever, and then they get kicked out, they get held on to till the very end, then they get kicked out, then some white people win? That happens all the time. And there's so much dark-skinned black women that don't get their shine. And if you look at women rappers, they're lighter, they're shorter, and they all have a certain image to them. And not to take away from the amazingness of their music, because Glorilla, I, I fucking, I, I guess 30 to Glorilla, you know, but there is definitely an image being pushed, you know? Oh, absolutely. And people are gonna point, and, and again, there's exceptions to the exceptions. Like I fucking love Lizzo. This mm -hmm. is great. Mm -hmm. Like, do you see Lizzo in the most, like her and Mandalorian with Jack Black? on-screen mm -hmm. chemistry off the fucking charts. That was mm -hmm. so fucking good. Like, <laughs> messy writing on that episode in general, but those two together, Yeah. I, I, I'd watch a whole Star Wars sitcom just yeah. about them. <laughs> Lizzo's kind of a natural, like, on the screen. And, and let, let, let's acknowledge that, like, Lizzo is one of the top flautists, but when she went and f***ing played the, the like, special, like, uh, whatever Benjamin's flute is, right? Oh, I, and everyone yeah, lost yeah, their yeah, fucking yeah, minds yeah, because yeah. they could not stand the idea yeah. of a fat black woman using something like that. So even if you make it, even if you make it, so so you make it through layers and layers and layers and layers of bi bigotry and biases and, and overlapping things that we've, we've been talking about, you're still going to get mass harassment. Mm -hmm. You're still going to get just horrific racism. Yeah. Like, look at John Boyega. Mm -hmm. Like, his yeah. treatment by Star Wars. Like, you yeah. can make it and still be treated like shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're going to have to be on your tipsy-topsy um, uh, house grow behavior. Yeah or you're done. <laughs> Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ending Aranok here. So originally we recorded both halves as being part of the same video, but we decided to split it up. However, we felt this part of the conversation that occurred later in the recording best fit here, but there isn't really good connective tissue. For context, next time we're reacting to anti-feminists versus feminists. Yeah, I want to say even like the title feminist is very sensationalized because it's kind of lost a lot of uh, its meaning in today's uh, world. I want to say that because uh, a lot of people that uh, a lot of men, I want to say uh, men and women too, but in a different kind of punching down way, uh, men use the term feminist in order to and then and then go on the most misogynistic tangents you've ever seen right that title doesn't really mean anything your actions do and um how you uh dissect patriarchy does i'm gonna hit on this which is which is that politics are something you do not something you are mm -hmm. so you either fucking live in 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 a in a way that is guided by feminist theory and thought which which that makes you a feminist because you are doing it you're doing it in every single day with your interactions with other people, with how you talk to other people, with how you approach topics, with your understanding of things. My feminism, the feminism that I subscribe, subscribe to, which which is a intersectional feminism, right? It is it is an like it, it is a viewpoint that is built up by mostly trans and black writers. For the love of God, go write, just go read Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks. Just fucking read Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks. Read read Bell Hooks. You don't even have to read long things. Okay, I'm not even asking you to read the long ones. Go read Feminism, A Transformational Politic. Go read Visionary Feminism. Bell Hooks lays out a couple of really important things in both of those, which is, which is one, if feminism is gonna be productive at all, it needs to approach things from an understanding that, that patriarchy hurts everyone, that feminism has to include not just women, but men as well. And while she wasn't talking about trans people in that context, it absolutely has to include trans people. It is, it is, it is not, I'm not gonna say that TERFs aren't feminists because I think it's silly to even have that argument. TERFs do not follow a productive political ideology. They are fundamentally fascist in their approach. They are fundamentally pro-white supremacy. Mm -hmm. They're pro-patriarchy. And I'm tired of this, this way of 
I, I would say there's a certain type of feminist that wants to distance ourselves, like like all forms of feminism, from the reality of the strain of white feminism. And white feminism is what turf turfs come from, right? Mm -hmm. White feminism is is the the type of feminism which the suffragettes practiced, where they were fucking racist as shit. Yes, they they campaigned for the vote, the white vote. I forgot I forgot to include. I want to be very clear as a disabled and mentally ill trans woman. I want to add in that like. If your feminism doesn't include deconstructing ableism and sanism, it's not a productive feminism. You can it, you can say it's a feminist framework, fine. I'm, I, I don't care for the semantics debate about what is and isn't feminism. What I care about is what form of feminist ideology and thought and politic, which is praxis, which doing the theory into the world, what is the form that is going to successfully dismantle white supremacist patriarchal capitalism? Because you have to demand dismantle all of it. You, if you do not dismantle white supremacy, you will fail to dismantle patriarchy. And this is the point that Bell Hooks is really fucking nails on, is that feminism needs to be a struggle in and of itself while also being a part of the greater struggle against these systems. And there's a little uh, problem on the left with armchair socialism, where basically it's very white supremacist on the left. I feel like a lot of thought leaders are responsible for this too, but uh, it's just as much an audience problem. Uh, you guys need to listen to people that are part of these groups. If you think you want to learn, you have to talk to people in those groups. Cause you might think you're most you're the most progressive person in the world. And hey, you're pushing socialism, but you're in a three-story house in the suburbs. Um your ideological socialism is doing nothing. Sorry. Thank you though. Like you voted for Biden, but uh you know like you gotta, you gotta, like, <laughs> no, but, yeah, like, like yeah. but like I wanna be clear about this because talking about like like intersectional analysis and things as a disabled person i can't do a lot of in-person activism and shit like i used to do and i used to do shit like i'd show up for fucking protests and mm -hmm. i would i would i would do volunteer things because because like praxis isn't just like oh i went to a political rally it's i built community and in so doing reinforce these ideas of mutual aid and care like mm -hmm. it's helping your neighbor as much as it is showing up to a protest as much as it is you know local garden and stuff but as a disabled person you're gonna have some limits and things it is okay if the only things you can do are through online to each according to their ability and to each according to their need Mm -hmm. And that means that you shouldn't beat yourself up if you're disabled and you can't do things in the way that people say you have to. Mm -hmm. But like when I talk about the praxis and doing of politics in your everyday, I do mean in your everyday mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Everything I do mm -hmm. is informed by my politics. Yeah. Or at least I do my best to have it inform my actions. I slip up. I fuck up. I learn from it. And the thing is that, and I know you do this and I do this, we keep people around us that will tell us the fuck off when, when we fuck up. Mm -hmm. And we will, we do. Yeah. You know, like Bellamy will come in and whip both of us if we see something yeah, wrong yeah, for yeah. good reason. Yeah, Bellamy's probably in the premier chat right now. That's part of why I love now. Bellamy. Bellamy's in the premier <laughs> chat right now, chatting it up, call, calling me the- We love yeah, you, yeah. we love you Bellamy, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Be no, like Bellamy's like one of my favorite fucking people on this planet mm -hmm. and part of that is that I know that Bellamy would never, ever let me being a jackass be allowed. And the same way that I know if I ever said some fucking racist shit around you, but like, it's possible, it'll probably happen. I'm a fucking white person. Like, <laughs> there's no way that I don't have some, some shit I haven't mm -hmm. unpacked yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely said a lot of um uh, really bad things. You uh, don't clip me. Totally, I just I just did twice in this video, but off screen off screen I mess uh I mess up a lot too, like just how I did. Screen. We, we, and, we, we, yeah, we mess up. We, we yeah. mess up. And and the thing is, I'm a f up. I make mistakes. Most recent mistake, okay? Khadija's most recent video. I had a giant fucking red line down the middle of me because I left it. I use the red line for like for like lining up my shots mm -hmm. when I'm filming. And I just left it in. And like, I could have just let people, like a lot of people were thinking it was like a purposeful art, artistic decision. And I could let people think that, but I'm like, nah, I'm gonna admit that I messed up. Like, and that's a silly mess up. Mm -hmm. But I think it's like, again, it's that like living your politics thing of like, 
I believe that it is valuable to discuss when we don't do something correctly. Because mm -hmm. if you can't do it for the small stuff, then how the hell are you gonna do it when you fuck up bad? Mm -hmm. And I've fucked up bad. Mm -hmm. Like, I've had times where I've said shit, and, uh, and like most of the time people forget that they've corrected me, which I find interesting, but I think that's that's the sort of same thing that like, I, I don't remember like 90% of the times that I've corrected you. I'm sh I know you've probably corrected me at some point on something. Like, <laughs> just no, you haven't. You know, because what, what Jubilee wants to present themselves as is these quote unquote productive conversations which are um, coming from different perspectives. But the thing is that the politics informing the way that you engage with that perspective matters, right? Different people coming together to discuss their experiences in a feminist framework is going to be productive because you have a common ground and understanding about the world, right? But what Jubilee is doing is Jubilee is running a business on sensationalization and centrist ideological messaging. So they present these things as verses, which is not how you want to have a productive conversation. They're trying to cast a net like as wide as possible. Yeah, but they also they also want to present certain viewpoints as acceptable. Viewpoints which are openly breaching the the paradox of tolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what the paradox of tolerance is, but just in case the audience doesn't, paradox of tolerance is the idea that you cannot tolerate intolerance if you are going to have tolerance as a fundamental tenet of your society and experience, right? You cannot allow fascists because fascists destroy tolerance. It is a paradox. You cannot tolerate fascism. You cannot tolerate racism. You cannot tolerate sexism. You cannot tolerate white supremacist patriarchal capitalism if you're going to have a productive conversation. You just can't. This is why I'm very tired of this thing of like, oh, nobody wants to have a conversation anymore. It's like, no, I, I'm i perfectly happy to have these conversations where we disagree on things. But that ends the instant you start advocating for a marginalized group being oppressed. When you start advocating for systems that harm us. My platform and what it embodies is just like everyone talking about intersectionality, no matter who you are. If we cannot engage as Bell Hooks lines out, in a feminism that is for everybody, a feminism which reaches people where they're at in their personal lives, it will fail. And the way that we need to do that, and you and I are doing this right now by having a dialectic, by having a conversation, by engaging in intersectional analysis from our standpoints and from our unique experiences, is, is we are performing what Bell Hooks lines out in feminism, a transformational politic. What, what frustrates me about Jubilee is they want to present themselves as if they are doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, see, I had a fucking point this whole time. I was really clever. Patreon.com slash Aaron on Patreon.com. Patreon.com. 